Good morning, I'm Blair Shade. And I'm Krista Montgomery. This is your J69 final summer broadcast. Construction began this month on the new School of Business building. The old tennis and sand volleyball courts were demolished at the site on Naismith Drive, east of Allen Fieldhouse. Thanks to a $20 million donation, the new building will be named Capitol Federal Hall and is expected to be completed by fall 2016. Summerfield Hall will undergo renovations, and according to Gavin Young from the Office of Public Affairs, no decisions have been made on what tenant will take over. Lawrence residents protested in front of the Lobby Hobby of 23rd Street after the Supreme Court handed down the Brewer v. Hobby Lobby ruling earlier this month. The decision states that the privately owned corporation, like Hobby Protesters Lobby, can withhold certain Hobby birth control Lobby methods Christine that go against the religious Supreme views. Burwell there are 89 people Lobby. protesting. Hobby Lobby has no objection, however, to 16 FDA-approved contraceptives. According to HobbyLobbyCase.com, a website set up by Hobby Lobby and the Beckett Fund, the craft store will provide coverage for all but four contraceptive methods. The drugs and devices Hobby Lobby claims interfere with the implantation of a fertilized egg include two types of IUDs and two types of emergency contraceptive, specifically the Plan B pill and Ella. The recent Supreme Court ruling allowing Hobby Lobby to refuse medical coverage of these types of contraceptives goes into the biological definition of conception itself. Hobby Lobby says that providing these four contraceptives violates their religious conviction that life begins at conception. The LEAD Center, in joint efforts with the student union activities, will allow students to perform live on stage. Derek Kwan, the new executive director for the LEAD Center, is looking to give students more real-world experience by allowing them to perform alongside well-known acts. We have established an official relationship with student union activities, and so you're going to see a lot more programming at the LEAD Center that is geared towards students. Um, we also, for the first time from a participatory perspective, have programmed uh, special guest artists with student ensembles on the, that are actually promoted as on our season. Unlike Murphy Hall, this gives students a chance to network with influential individuals outside of Lawrence and open the door for more opportunities. If students don't want to be on stage, there are other options for them to get involved. It will serve a variety of roles and, and have a lot of different kinds of benefits. First, um, students will get the experience of performing. Um, and not only that, the, the students behind the camera will get the experience of operating the equipment. Looking for something to do in Lawrence this weekend? Reporter Annie Ray Carr takes us to an all-women art exhibit at Wonder Fair. After seeing an imbalance in the ratio of men to women artists with their work on display in galleries, owner and director of Wonder Fair, Meredith Moore, put together 16 women artists to display their work at the Young Women Artists Exhibit at 803 Massachusetts Street. Moore said she wanted to create an exhibit to feature and empower women artists after she found a 7-3 to three disparity between men's and women's art shown in galleries. There are many worse problems in the world and in society, but I happen to work in the arts, so this is some, a problem that I can address with my expertise, and that's why women, that's why we chose to do it. I have this gallery, I should do something good with it as often as possible. I hope that this exhibition help some woman artists to either try harder and succeed more, or maybe it'll make a gallerist in Kansas City look at his roster and decide he needs to pick up a couple of extra women artists to balance things out, and then maybe we'll help that woman artist succeed. A 2010 university graduate, Alicia Kelly, used patterns, shadows, and flower cutouts in her artwork. Kelly says she used her skills in printmaking to create the piece like Seatco where there's men and women working together and we're on equal boundaries. I don't feel any weirdness or any shyness. I also think women can sometimes make themselves shy and I've been there where you're just maybe you're not confident about your work but it's you know when you have the backing and the passion for it it should show. 
Wonder Fair will host the exhibit until August 24th. This is Anuri Carr from Kansas News signing off. Kansas City is now home to a new record-breaking attraction, but it's only for those th thrill seekers who don't mind climbing a few hundred stairs and getting a little wet on the way down. The air was filled with hype and anticipation as Schlitterbahn's Baruch, the world's tallest water slide, opened to the public on July 10th in Kansas City, Kansas, after three delays forced eager thrill seekers to contain their excitement for just a little bit longer. Baruch was originally scheduled to open to the public back on May 23rd along with the rest of Schlitterbahn, but safety concerns caused the opening date to be pushed back so park officials could make the proper reconfigurations and adjustments to the ride. Towering at 168 feet 7 inches, Brucht, which means insane in German, was certified the tallest water slide in the world by Guinness World Records back in April. Riders have to be ambitious to endure the 264 steps up to the top of Brucht before they can scream their way back down. The ride features a three-person raft with specific height and weight restrictions to ensure rider safety. Park goers had mostly positive adrenaline-filled responses after departing their Brucht rafts on July 10th. It was free fun. It's awesome. Upon arriving at the park, riders can make a reservation for an hour-long slot to ride down the slide. The line's not so cool, but the ride's fun. Schlitterbahn is open daily until August 17th and for two weekends following that before closing for the season on September 1st. This has been Aaron Oreck reporting for Kansan Media. Well, Blair, I cannot wait to try that out. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty impressive. I, it looks pretty wet as well. I'm very excited to try that as well. All right, after the break, Ben Carroll will join us with his special guest, G.J. Melia. Stay tuned. If I had a superpower, what would it be? It would be magic. Yeah, watch. Is that your card? Is that your card? The ability to make lots and lots of money. <laughs> I could bend silverware with my mind. Is that your card? No. Is that your card? <laughs> or you could just give blood. Welcome back, and now we are joined with Canton sports writer G.J. Melia. And, uh, you know, G.J., uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, you know, it's summer semester's uh, kind of winding down, and football's right around the corner. And uh, as we know, Big 12 Media Days uh, happened earlier this week, and uh, Charlie Weiss kind of uh, fired himself as offensive coordinator and, uh, you know, kind of brought in a new spread offense. Kind of like, what are, what are, like, your thoughts and opinions on the new offense? Well, John Reagan, he was a former offensive coordinator at Rice. He's going to bring in a, a little bit different system, and Charlie Weiss is not going to really have much to do with it. He'll kind of oversee it during the week, but on game days, he's not going to be a part of it at all and just focus on managing both the offense and the defense, the head coach position, rather than trying to manage everything. Um, and his offense, John Reagan, that is, his offense is more, Montel Cozart isn't going to be looking to run as much. He'll m be looking to distribute to his wide receivers. And, uh, yeah, you know, all, we have a new, new look offense coming up as we lost James Sims uh, to graduation, a couple others, uh, Andrew Terzilli and uh, Jake Heaps both transferred. Um, as you said, Montel Cozart will kind of be our uh, scrambling quarterback, but uh, what, what do you kind of look for with uh, Jimmy Mundine at tight end and, uh, you know, Miami o of Ohio transfer and uh, Nick Harwell at wide receiver? You seen uh, differences? Well, yeah, I mean, Nick Harwell, I mean, he's coming off of sitting out a year from transferring, but then two years he's two years removed from a 97, uh, or excuse me, a 97 reception year. Yep. So almost 100 receptions, over a thousand yards. Um, he was always a great target, and Miami of Ohio was never the best team. They were at sometimes yep. worse than than this KU team has been these past couple years, and he was still able to to contribute to the team. So that's a great great uh, thing to have um, coming in this, the, excuse me, this year. And then Jumei Medine, I mean, he's up for the Mackey Award, best tight end in the country on a preseason watch list, and there's big things to come, especially after last year where he did not live up to some of the expectations he had for himself yeah. and the team had. Both those guys, I think, will definitely uh, give our offense a big bump that we definitely need. Um, Let's kind of move on to the defense. You know, it's kind of led by a you know returning senior, 230-pound linebacker Ben Heaney from Hutchison, Kansas. You know, he's a big deal. He's a kamikaze of a linebacker. He's quick. He's big, and uh, he he's kind of returning. He's the Big 12 returning tackler the in the conference. So, uh, kind of like, what do you expect from the defense as a uh, you know you've brought in someone else new? So. Yeah. Well, let's hope he's not leading the Big 12 in tackles because the main reason why he was last year is because it was really a one-man show for him. He averaged eight to ten tackles 
a game, and that's usually not a good sign right. for any linebacker. Yeah, you want to get tackles, but you also want a gang tackle. You want guys helping you out. Yeah. And he didn't have that much last year. Hopefully, Keon Stowers, um, a senior leader, will be uh, able to contribute as well and get some get some uh, pressure on the quarterback. And then also, you, you'll have to look at Dexter McDonald and, I and Isaiah Johnson in the secondary. Big key guys. You got one newcomer of the year in uh, Isaiah Johnson uh, last year, and they're, they're going to have to help out with, with the, that gang tackling as well. Yeah. I mean, I think, our, I think our defense is probably one of our stronger points, especially I mean, Ben Heaney's, you know, he's big. He's been named all big to uh, preseason watches, which is huge. But uh, let's go to the conference, kind of the schedule now. Uh, we have a tough schedule. You know, we're in the Big 12. It's a big, tough uh, football conference. But uh, I mean, let's kind of go to the non-conference games, kind of in the beginning of the season. We play Central Michigan uh, as a third game. We play Duke, who got, I mean, they lost 45-7 to in the ACC championship to Jameis Winston in the Semin four State Seminoles. But, like, I mean, is that, that going to be a tough game to kind of come out and win and kind of come out and, like, kind of get a good record before going into a conference play? Yeah, well, Duke, Duke is not what they were last year by any means. They were 10-4 and four team, and it was one of their best seasons in school history. They aren't as talented as they were last year. They get lost a couple guys, but they still are going to be easily a bowl contention team. Mm -hmm. So I expect them to, to put up a fight, and I'm sure that, that their stadium will be rocking for that. Um, and if KU can, can hold on and, and play them close, then you may have a game on our hands. But if not, um, it, could, it could get ugly. They've got a good quarterback and uh, a, a high potent offense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of the Big 12 games that we got, you know, we got to go into Manhattan and play, uh, you know, those Kansas State Wildcats. It's always tough to go in there and play Manhattan. I mean, they're always a good team, Coach Snyder. But uh, what about we going into in Norman or play Oklahoma? And they're always a good team. But uh, kind of like what kind of games do you kind of see us playing well and maybe even come out on top in the Big 12? Well, if they can compete against K-State, I think that's very viable. K-State is not going to be as good as they have been the past couple years, but they are flying under the radar because media people like, like myself are saying, eh, they aren't as good, where Bill Snyder, he can really do anything. Yeah. Um, and then other games, obviously we talked, about, we talked about Southeast Missouri State and Central Michigan, those two games. Um, those are winnable games. Um, another winnable game, they could probably take is either Oklahoma State or Texas coming in. If this team is really what Charlie Weiss expects and everyone expects from them among the KU people, um, which is pretty, I mean, it, there's higher expectations, so they should be able to steal one of those if they can play up to potential. Right, and you know, Charlie Weiss entering his third year, he's kind of been building his team for the last two years and working hard to do that. So I, I would kind of say the stakes got to be high this year to yeah. kind of come in and play hard. Well, uh, you know, Jayhawks kick off their season September 6th inside Memorial Stadium. Uh, it's an evening game it's, uh, against South or Southeast Missouri State at 6 o'clock. GJ, you going to the game? I am. All right, uh, I'll probably be seeing you there then. Okay. Awesome. Uh, that wraps us up. That wraps it up uh, with uh, GJ. And uh, GJ, thanks a lot for coming on. Good morning, yeah, KU. Thanks. Today and, uh, thanks for thanks. having me. Always, yep. always up to talking football. Awesome. That sounds great. And uh, stick around, and we will have Anna Reed with more news. Ramadan, the ninth month in the Muslim calendar, began on June 29th this year. During the month of Ramadan, Muslims from all over the world fast from dawn to dusk. Muslim fasts demonstrate obedience to their God, Allah, by willfully abstaining from eating, drinking, and having sex. Ramadan is a means for spiritual and moral improvement and rectitude. The last day of Ramadan is Eid, which happens about 29 and 30 days after the first day of fasting. This year it ends on July 29th and celebrated with a big feast with family and friends. It's been a relatively mild summer, which has been a pleasant surprise for students who stayed in Lawrence. Kate Shelton has a story about cooler weather sticking around. For the normal scorching month of July, it's been unseasonably cold. On July 15th, Lawrence reached a record low of 52. Highs for the entire week were only expected to be in the upper 70s. Local hotspots during the summer, such as Clinton Lake and various pools, were virtually empty this week. Chris Schubert was out walking his dog during the cooler weather this week. 
I'm enjoying the cool weather. I get really hot really easily and this is perfect weather for me. This cool weather is caused by an upper level low from the Northeast Pacific region. This pushes the cooler air to the Midwest and the Plains. Emma Shelton said her plans were changed because of the cold weather. Um, I made plans to go swimming with friends yesterday and we had to cancel because it was too cloudy and the water was too cold. However, temperatures are forecast to be back up in the upper 80s and lower 90s this weekend. This is Kate Shelton reporting for the University Daily Kansan. Getting around town is already difficult, but add construction to that scenario and you might have waiting in traffic for a while. Here's how construction has affected some students this summer. Construction around Lawrence took place as classes ended. Many of the projects have taken all summer to do, while some might not be done until school starts. People found it hard navigating their way through it and finding new routes to take to work or class. Um, I absolutely hate construction. It's just a nuisance, especially KU's construction because I have to go pick up my boyfriend from work we didn't have a car, so I have to go around the long way around construction. Many people have found constructions a nuisance ever since it began earlier this summer. Although many construction projects are starting to end since school is about to start. Um, the construction hasn't really affected me that much because I do try to avoid it as much as possible, but sometimes it does get very hectic because it like doubles the time it takes to get somewhere. This is Arena Chitanavon with Tanzania. Welcome back. Finally, if you're looking for something fun to do this weekend, the Floozies are back in town. The Lawrence Electrofront duo will be headlining at Crossroads tomorrow night in Kansas City. Brothers Matt and Mark Hill have traveled much of the country, but the past few months are excited to bring their music back home. Doors open at 6 p.m. and the show begins at 7 p.m. Ben will be back after a few breaks. What do you mean? What do you mean my mocha's not here? I'm Ben Allen, seriously. Where? What about here? Is that better? Oh, I'm, now my arm's disappearing. Obviously, this is even worse. Oh, I look on. good. I look real good. Make sure you tune in on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. to listen to me and a bunch of other sports guys tell you what you've missed and give you a little bit of an inside perspective on some of the athletes and basically what we're thinking. Make so. sure you tweet at us at 3 in key on Twitter. I don't know where else you would tweet at us, but you should do that because um, I'm lonely and I need friends. Please follow me. Ben Allen Sports. It'll make your day better. Probably not. It'll make mine better, though. The linebacker Ben Heaney has been recognized on multiple preseason watch lists for national awards. The senior standout is on the Chuck Bednarik and Bronco Nerkarski watch list and the preseason All Big 12 team as well. The Hutchison, Kansas, Kansas native was acknowledged for these awards after leading KU with 88 tackles and 11 and a half tackles for loss last season. The Kansas football program will open up its season on, on September 6th against Southeast Missouri State. One thing Ben and his teammates won't have to worry about this year is the track. This summer, KU has removed the track from Memorial Stadium. Blair Shade gives us a closer look. I'm here at the Memorial Stadium where the athletic department decided to renovate Cravisto Field and remove the track and replace it with turf. As you can see behind me, the track has already been removed, which started June 24th and will be a six-week process. The track around the football field was a safety hazard, according to associate lecturer Jim Marcioni. Marcioni added that the other track and field events caused safety issues as well as the all-weather track. Sure, I mean, you not only had the track, remember, Blair, but you had uh, uh, long jump um, runways and, and pole vault runways and, uh, you know, uh, jump pits and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, uh, landing on those is, 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 is uh, hard on the body. Um, so, you know, fortunately, all of that will, will be gone. And Former KU running back Connor Embry confirmed the lack of safety with the track in an email to the university media. Embry said the track was always on his mind when playing, and Tony Pearson's concussion last season was caused by the track during the Texas Tech game on October 5th. 
at the removal of the track, turf will extend 37 feet longer on both sidelines and 80 feet longer behind the north end zone. According to Marcioni, this will provide a better optical look for the fans and a student agrees. I think it's good for students because it could potentially add more space and, and for our alumni as well, they could potentially put in more state um, seats and I also think it's important for the university because it doesn't look like we have a high school football team playing there anymore. KU's volleyball team will have additional opportunities to showcase their skills on the national platform this season. Every home match will be aired on ESPN3 this season, with two matches featured on national television. From a recruiting standpoint, head coach Ray Bouchard says the ESPN3 option is important for out-of-state families who can't attend in person. The Jayhawks' first national appearance will be on October 5th on, ESP, on ESPNU against defending Big 12 champion Texas Longhorns. The second match will be aired on Fox Sports Network on October 22nd against Iowa State. If you're not into varsity athletics or intramural sports, there are still some interesting sports you can get involved in. Chris Montgomery gives us a closer look at bike polo. I'm here in Edgewood Park, where every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday night, the Scary Larry Bike Polo chapter of Lawrence comes to play in this converted court, converted specifically to keep them off the streets. We've played in Lawrence all over the city, but then uh, we were lucky enough to get the police called on us and ended up getting our own space because of that. Um, the city worked with us um, to rent our own space and um, now we're out here at Edgewood. Bike polo consists of two teams of bicycles who aim to hit a ball with mallets at the opposing team's goal. Enthusiasts play for a variety of reasons. You really improve your balance on your bike and your bike skills. Um, so even that like improves your bike skills just commuting around. I shoot goals not very much but I do get goals. Yeah, I have a lot of bikes and this just kind of seems to fit in with my lifestyle as far as the sport. The Lawrence Bike Polo Chapter also competes in national tournaments. In 2009 we went to a tournament. Um, my team got in about middle of the road. It was our first tournament. It was the first time we'd actually seen hardcore bike polo except for on videos. Our other team got dead freaking last so they got an award. Um, and then we were hooked. We started participating in tournaments. You know, some students end up liking it because we go on trips around the country and uh, they get to meet people all, from all over the world and play bike polo and look at bikes and get new bike material and stuff like that. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty rad sport. This is Krista Montgomery, Canson Media. Finally, an evening with Naismith made an appearance in Independence, Kansas on July 2nd. The event was sponsored by the Alumni Association and University Libraries offered a free look at rare artifacts from James Naismith's life. Former Kansas basketball coach Ted Owens was in, a, was in attendance to discuss his book and his time at Kansas. University Libraries also contributed their photos to, on, the, on the display. Director of Communications for University Libraries Rebecca Smith said there, there were 40 to, 40 to 50 different artifacts to see and hold. Artifacts included Naismith's personal measurements of, ath of athletes to a sock worn by one of the players. The 1952 National Championship Players Trophy was also on display. In case you missed the event, Smith said all the artifacts are held in Spencer Research Library and are available to view. That will wrap it up for sports. After a quick break, Blair and Krista will be back to wrap up our show along with Jack Fay with the weather. S stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. The Lawrence Habitat for Humanity focuses on breaking the cycle for, on poverty. And last month, the community saw its mission be put to work again. Reporter Ben Carroll has the story. No more renting. We can uh, start doing what we need to do. It, it means a lot. The Logan family was chosen back in 2012 to receive the new home because they had a need and met the criteria that Habitat for Humanity looks for when choosing its donees. Uh, so they need to fall between uh, 
30 and 60% of the median income in Lawrence, uh, which is about $77,000. Lawrence is on the high end. For Kamari and her two daughters, move-in day can't come soon enough. First thing I'm going to do is bring a rocking chair my mom bought me 14 years ago of her passing. So I still kept that rocking chair when she said, I knew one day I was going to buy a home, and that chair is probably going to be the first thing coming in this house. Where do you hang out after hours? For some students, Perkins is the place. Jack Fay tells us why. Where can a student go on any given day, almost any given time, meet up with friends, do some studying, and get a quick meal? The answer is Perkins. So what makes Perkins a destination for students and others alike? I chose to meet at Perkins tonight because it, there's Apparently, according to my parents, there's been a long-standing tradition of people who do not sleep at night coming here to drink coffee and talk to each other. I am here, as always, preparing my takeover of the world. Just the fact that I was here, because I'm hungry. <laughs> and I happen to be in Lawrence. Some students find Perkins a good place to quietly study. Gathering places like this have always felt like a second home to me. We're better together than where there's food bottomless cups of coffee. There's just a nice comforting atmosphere about it. That's basically why I come here. Because I know people here. If you're going to be up all night studying, a bottomless cup of coffee is a pretty good enticement. And, and, and when Jack's not at the Perkins, he's up on the roof. Jack, how's the weather up there? Looking gorgeous up here today. Lovely 71 degrees outside. For people that are trying to plan out the rest of their day, Jack, how is the weather planning the rest of the day? Rest of the day, it's going to be roughly in the high 80s, low 90s, and then this weekend we're looking at uh, nothing but 90s. Nothing but 90s? What do you, uh, what do you recommend for the weekend uh, weather-wise, Jack? Weather-wise, Saturday is the only iffy thing. They've got 20% chance of a, a rainstorm coming, but apart from that, it's going to be clear skies all weekend. Sounds great, and uh, people have a great weekend. Thanks for watching the last ed uh, edition of Journalism 699. Stay classy, Lawrence.